So earlier we heard about the need for rigor around impact performance and not just impact intention. And that's one of the issues I hope we'll get into in this session as we ask what's next for impact management. We'll kick things off with a video from IDB Invest, which is the private sector arm of the Inter-American Development Bank Group. We're gonna learn a little bit more about its impact management framework as one example of what impact management looks like. Now it's my pleasure to go ahead and welcome our panelists. Alessandro Mafioli is the Chief of Development Effectiveness Division at IDB Invest. Fahin Aliboy is Managing Director of the JP Morgan Development Finance Institution, which was announced in January, 2020. Andrew Herskowitz is the Chief Development Officer of the US International Development Finance Corporation, which my colleague Edva has reported on extensively in recent months, if you wanna learn more about their development strategy released earlier this month. So I wanna begin with a question for all of you, which really narrows in on these structures you've set up, what, what problems they aim to solve. So IDB Invest has been implementing its integrated impact management approach for over a decade. We just got a little preview of that. Um, JP Morgan and the DFC have just recently built these impact management and metric systems. So again, take us back to what was the biggest problem you were trying to solve that wasn't working in your previous system? And we'll start with Alessandro. Yes. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Catherine, for the for uh, inviting me to this panel and and uh, and for this question, is a, which is a very interesting one. The <clears throat> as you mentioned, we have been in this for a, for quite quite a time. We started having a, a, our own um, impact score in, in two thousand eight and manage our portfolio, looking at both impact and financial contributions since then. Uh, then over time, we have been improving this system. And but I have to say, in 2016, where we had the, the merge out, so the reorganization of all the private sector activities of IDB Group and the consolidation IDB Invest, that was really the opportunity to look at, at this again and see what we can, could improve. So I would highlight two, two challenges and two uh, key uh, efforts we, we made. One was to we look at our impact uh, rating system, and we wanted to make it a little bit more rigorous and more ground into the idea of a social, the estimation of a social economic rate of return. So what is the return for the society of this investment? Something that is similar to a financial return, but the return for the, for the economy, for the society. And of course, accompany this with a stakeholder analysis, not only what is the return, but for whom, who is really benefiting uh, from, from this investment, a sustainability part, and what the additionality part. So what is our role in making all this, this happen? So that was, the idea we had, and we had the mandate to make this operational. So that, that is a big challenge. How you build something that is rigorous, embedded in something that is clear how it works, but still remain operational. And operational for us means that it's predictable. So our investment officer understand how we measure team and what we are looking for in, in, the, in the transaction. Though it's always an expert that then give the, 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 final, the final score is flexible. So it has to be something modular, it can be applied different kind of uh, different kind of transaction. And in the end, it's also cost effective. It's, there, is, there is an element that we, you know, I'm an economist at the background, you give me infinite data, infinite time, I will produce the best possible estimate of the impact, but, but that is something that is, doesn't go with uh, uh, being operational in financing, in financing projects. So that was the challenge. And so the result was the, the Delta, the Development Effectiveness Learning Tracking Assessment Tool, and uh, which we believe that really 
summarize well this, this, this characteristic, I mean, rigorous and, and operational. The second challenge we had was to strengthen our ability to go end to end. So the, the cycle of investing for impact start from the origination process, what kind of deal you look for. So what are the priorities? What, what are the development challenges we want to address? What are the deepest problems we want to, to tackle? Then the structure and origination, the supervision, because once it disbursed, then when really the development story starts. So we disburse our resources to a to uh, client and then makes the investment here where development happened. So we wanted to strengthen our ability to monitor results during the execution of this investment so we can manage it with our client. We want to partner with our client during the investment. And then the final part, which is evaluation, which doesn't simply <clears throat> fulfill an accountability purpose, which is very important and for us as, as MDB is super important, but mainly and also a, a learning purpose. How do we learn from what we do? How we are a learning um, organization that can learn from what work, what doesn't work, and we feedback in the way we select and structure projects. Those were the two biggest challenges. And if you want to see the results of this, uh, in addition to the short video, we just um, uh, issue a publication that explain our, our system and is available on our website in case you want to go deeper into that. Thanks, Alessandro. Fahin, I want to turn it over to you. And um, part of why I'm so grateful to have your perspective on this panel is you come from the world of development finance. You previously worked with the International Finance Corporation and are now working within JP Morgan. Um, so you were brought in to, to solve a problem. Can you outline what that problem was that your system is set up to solve? Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure. So the JP Morgan Development Finance Institution was set up earlier this year to really try and bring development finance to the capital markets. As emerging markets become more sophisticated, as they move towards capital markets to raise money, be it debt, equity, or different types uh, of other uh, financings, um, there, we felt that there was a need to try and bring that development framework to those transactions where commercial and investment banks like JP Morgan operated. As you know, the DFIs work really as buy side investors, right? Giving money directly to their clients. Whereas a commercial and investment bank uh, is a sell side operator. They're raising money for their clients by bringing in institutional money from institutional investors. And we thought we had a very interesting role to play there to make sure that those deals done in emerging markets with a development angle could have that proper framework. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, I do come from the world of DFI, but unbeknownst to me, even before I joined, um, JP Morgan already had a working group in place uh, with the IFC um, and also took in an, um, input from many of the other DFIs to say, how do we bring in best practice impact methodologies to our and adapt it to our business model? So uh, we looked at uh, AIM, we looked at many others and tried to then have a methodology that we could bring to our clients and our types of transactions, which, as I said, happen on the capital markets. But then we have um, and we have developed something that is very similar to what AIM does, which is looking at the development gap of that transaction. It's a use, use of proceeds transaction, uh, use of proceeds analysis. It looks at the development gap and then it looks at the investment contribution. What we've also done is try to look at how these transactions contribute to the SDGs. We're seeing stronger investor demand for, uh, for um, projects that have uh, a link to the SDGs and we wanted to help uh, make that a little bit more clear. And this is really now this impact methodology which we put on our website the day we launched is something that we um, is fundamental to what, our, what we do. So when we go to a client transaction we now have a framework that is credible, that's been shown to the DFIs, but also to the broader public. Um, and we can evaluate transactions against this methodology. And you know, I wouldn't get into all of the details, but it has a lot of the elements that have been mentioned uh, by the earlier panelists as well. We um, are very um, cognizant of the fact that this is a, a work in process. Um, and ever since launching, um, I have a team with a director of development impact. So we've given this a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, resource, um, have been speaking with the likes of IDB Invest. They've been a great partner with DEG, with FMO, and then more industry level players such as GIN, right? Uh, that also has impact methodology, HIPSO, which is the alignment of different DFIs uh, and the joint impact model to say, how can we better it? And as we do transactions, 
we will improve, we will, we attempt to improve our methodology and make it more adaptable to the capital markets. And Fahim, we had some questions coming in um, for those who are less familiar to just clarify some of the acronyms. So I'm familiar with some of these institutions you mentioned, but can you just break down again, who are some of the institutions you're in touch with? And um, if you could just spell out who these entities are, like the Jin, who we heard from earlier. Absolutely. So uh, these are, uh, I mean, I have to think about who all the acronyms are, but the Jin is essentially a, a, a coalition of people looking at impact investing. And um, they've really been an early uh, leader in this and have coalesced a lot of impact investors to see if we can find standards and to standardize the way impact investors look at uh, the impact, and in our case, development impact. Uh, HIPSO is a group of development finance institutions that um, want to kind of align our methodologies because there's so many different methodologies out there. And the joint impact model is, is a coalition of both development finance institution and some uh, private money uh, to do the same. Thanks so much for that. I wanna hand it over to Andy. So um, Andy, I think many people in our audience might be working through the nitty gritty of this within development finance institutions. So can you just talk us through again, the problem that your system is set up to solve and how you designed the system to address that problem? Sure, DFC, the US uh, International Development Finance uh, Corporation was, first of all, we were excited to be launched in January of this year. And then a few months later, we launched our impact quotient tool, the IQ tool, which measures impact in a way that we hadn't done before uh, with our predecessor agencies, uh, OPIC and also USAID's Development Credit Authority. One of the issues that we had previously is we weren't really looking at country context. Um, we also weren't weighing impact. I mean, we were looking at impacts, but everything was being weighed the same way. We weren't taking deductions for adverse impacts either. So we really... Uh, we, we looked at those issues and we came up with a new system, which is really meant to be a living tool. And we're doing things like we're actually assigning values, uh, looking at the degree of the particular type of impact. There are three basic categories that we look at. We look at inclusion, we look at economic growth, um, uh, we look at inclusion, we look at economic growth, and why am I drawing a blank on the third one? Oh, on innovation, of course. So innovation as well. And so, so each of those things get weighed. And when you look at inclusion, inclusion might be something like jobs. It's a big difference between whether a project is going to be adding 10 jobs or it's going to be adding 1,000 jobs. Previously, you would have gotten the same credit for something like that. So we have algorithms that we've developed, which aren't perfect, but that do make adjustments. And then if there are, are, are social or environmental issues, we make certain deductions as well. Um, and then we also use the IQ tool, not just as a way to measure impact, but it's a way to incentivize and create impact. So we would sit down with a client and say, have you considered implementing these policies that might provide greater social benefits to your employees? And if they do that, they may give them, give them additional bonus points as well. So we're using this as a way of, because every client ultimately wants to have their project classified as being highly developmental. So we're using this way as, as almost a, a carrot to try to encourage clients to, to have greater impact than they otherwise would have had. Thank you. Now, when you set up these systems, a, a, a big part of the process is really changing incentives, which is hard within an institution, right? With long time systems and traditions. I, I wanna talk about incentives. And I, I know we've, we've spent some time kind of digging into your models. Let's go a little more rapid fire here. When it comes to setting up these new models, how do you change incentives? For example, by embedding impact into how people are um, evaluated on their performance. So I'll start with Andy, if that's all right. How does this- So it's tough. So, so this is tough. This is one that we're getting ready, trying to tackle right now. I've been having conversations about this because we're a government institution and there's, you're, you're dealing with government employees whose salaries are fairly set. And the bonus is we're not private sector. You don't have these massive bonuses for, for having certain incentives. But I always, always reassure myself that the people who work at DFC are doing it because they care about development. So even when we just launched our brand new development strategy called Roadmap for Impact, which has baked into it specific metrics, specific outcomes that, will, that are tied to people, such as getting people access to potable water, getting people access to electricity or the internet. The question came up, well, well can we put this in people's performance metrics? The truth is that being heavy handed like that doesn't really work, at least in government it doesn't. 
because everybody has a new idea and everybody has a new metric. And next thing you know, the people are all trying to meet all these different metrics and they're constantly shifting. So, so we're counting on the fact that people are bought into what we're trying to do. Um, I compare it to the 2X initiative, which DFC has, which is works on women's economic empowerment. People are excited at screening and credit and investment committee meetings when they talk about how the project is advancing the 2X initiative and creating jobs for women or that the company has a lot of women on the board. It doesn't require a lot more than that. So I'm hoping that people will be equally excited about these other things. Thanks, Andy. And we'll hear a bit more about the 2X initiative later today. So I appreciate you teeing that up. Um, Alessandro, can you jump in on this question? What does this look like in terms of incentives and, and measuring performance um, as well as managing portfolios? Sure. Uh, thank you. No, and and um, so building on what uh, Andy was saying, we, 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 do, we did introduce some incentives that we of course, we don't have a, a level of, of bonus from many pay as, as a private sector, but we do have something. So we did introduce as a metric for our investment officer um, also the a reference to the to the delta score of the transaction at entry and during execution. So that is something we we, we did do, and there is something that, of course, there are various metrics included there, and and we think that is that is it is powerful, especially because I think our people are very embedded in the mission they have, and it's good to. In a way, in a way, uh, reward this this effort. So, in, in a portfolio approach, you have to be careful because, of course, there are other metrics we are looking at. Also, how we contribute to our financial sustainability, and and, and many other uh, factors we are looking at. So, it's one of the things we look at, and and within this health in terms of in terms of uh, creating the right incentive. In terms of portfolio, I think in addition to the micro in incentive at the level of the person, is important also that you create incentive at the level of the organization. So, having targets in terms of we have target set in terms of how we meet our top priority, uh, gender lending, uh, lending to small and more vulnerable country, lending to MSMEs and so on and so forth. Those are things that help to guide how you build a portfolio in addition to have a delta, a, a delta median score as a target. Also consider the, the, delta, the delta score, we have a minimum threshold. No, no transaction can be approved for us if it doesn't meet a minimum threshold, which increase as, as when the, the financial contribution to the transaction diminishes. So we have hard threshold there, we have a median score that we need to meet as organization, and we have incentive at the, at the individual level, try to, to push the organization. And, and the point of end is, is absolutely true. In the end, we are invested this, with this mission, uh, but it's a way also to, to check ourselves and to create reward for, for good work and done in these areas. Thank you. And um, as we're running short on time, and I do want to make sure to bring it to this moment in COVID-19 and what these structures look like in this moment. So Fahim, feel free to jump in briefly on that question around incentives and measuring performance. But I did have a question come in from the audience that I want to direct at you as well. Um, someone from the audience asks, would you withdraw from an investment which develops to have a very high financial rate of return, but a very low return on social and environmental metrics? I think that might be a question around where does an investment like that fit within JP Morgan, or if an investment doesn't pan out the way you might have expected. Um, so feel free to jump in quickly on that previous question, but then would love to hear your thoughts on the question from the audience. And you're on mute. I think that first question is very important because uh, it's been very interesting to see how incentives work in a private sector uh, environment. And, and it shows a little bit of a difference and probably what the two other uh, speakers mentioned. The incentive uh, in a commercial and investment bank is getting deals done. So what I have found really impressive is that when we have come in and partnered with our product teams and gone and spoken with clients and clients bite at wanting to, you know, have this development impact analysis done and to, you know, uh, to, to show it to investors, teams latch on immediately because if their clients like it, they want to do it everyone is incentivized to, to kind of move in that direction. So I think that's been super interesting. And the second part is the demand from institutional investors. It is clear that the large institutional investors that uh, invest in emerging markets want to do more in impact, in climate, in uh, SDG alignment, in fact. And so when uh, clients see that the institutional money coming towards them are coming from folks that care about this, again, the incentives are aligned. So for me, I've just seen kind of the pieces of a puzzle kind of coming together and incentives uh, being aligned around those who see value around uh, development impact. And what I would like very much is, uh, we've seen what's happened in the green bond market, right? Um, at, at some point it became 
patently clear that this is what investors were demanding. So more and more clients uh, and issuers move their offering towards that uh, space. Um, with respect to the audience question on financial return, we are very clear in our methodology that um, no transaction that we, the DFI at JP Morgan, would look at would not pass all of the typical filters of JP Morgan. So that includes JP Morgan's exclusion criteria, and there's some you know, already baked in there, credit criteria, know your clients and reputation. So all of those things are the first filter, and one of those is credit. So the credit process is um, robust, independent, and will happen regardless of the development wrap that we bring to the transactions. So we don't see any kind of trade-off uh, in that respect. We just hope that sometimes by bringing additional DFI money into a transaction, we may help with credit enhancement or risk mitigation, but there should be no trade-off with any of the basic parameters that JP Morgan looks at. Thank you. Now, this may be our final question. So I would ask speakers to, to be kind of rapid fire in your responses here. But as I mentioned, I want to bring it to this moment. So each of you have developed your separate systems. We've learned about those systems. But one of the things mentioned earlier in our event today was the importance of speaking the same language and using the same metrics when it comes to impact management. Um, now we have this global pandemic disrupting a lot of the uh, investments you're making and, and probably a lot of the systems you've set up. So can you just quickly touch on how do your systems work together when it comes to measuring impact, particu particularly as COVID-19 complicates the picture and raises the stakes? Anyone who wants to jump in first on that and briefly. Go ahead, Alessandro. Well, I can say something briefly. I think that the, in the end, the point is um, measuring what we measure in the same way. All this instance boils down to certain indicators we're tracking and we want to measure. And, and then as plugging to certain algorithm that we use to produce an, an impact score or development gap and uh, a quotient. So I think that the, the most important work, Fahin already mentioned, this working group on harmonization of indicators. So make sure that when we say we're, we're going to focus on job creation, we measured it, it in, the, in the same way. Everybody's asking the same question, the same data, and we process in the, in the then if the processing of this lead to, you know, our own um, algorithm that is, I don't think it's a Though there is a work on that too, convergence in terms of standards. We have the operating principle for impact management that are setting standards for how this system they should look like. There are certain model emerging who's looking at more monetization like us, more gaps and as ever. But, but I think that, so there is a harmonization in the models, but the most important thing, measure what we measure in the same way. And, and of course the SDGs help also in terms of speaking the same language as the private sector. There's another big thing for us to translate everything then into SDG contributions that we can work with co-investors. That's it. Thank you, Alessandro. Measure what we measure in the same way. Are we making progress? Fahin, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think I would agree with Alessandro. Um, we are not changing the way we would evaluate a transaction because of COVID. I just think that COVID has given us an incredible opportunity because the demand for, for putting money towards social health um, and, uh, you know, uh, and sanitation, many other things is just growing, the demand is growing and the level of disclosure that people are doing. So people are raising COVID bonds and social bonds and people realize that their citizens and their shareholders and stakeholders are asking them to say, what exactly are you doing um, in, in this um, pandemic to help you know, make sure that we tackle what we, the economic and health impacts today and also prepare ourselves for the future. So I think it's really put a spotlight on, on development impact, uh, both in emerging markets as well as developed markets that were not prepared. And I think that um, it's, but the methodologies shouldn't change and we should have similar indicators to which we can report to. And Andy, we'll, we'll close with you, how these systems can work together. Look, so, so DFC's, let me make sure, okay. DFC's approach is always to tr be as collaborative as possible. Um, we, we all are participating in the Global Impact Investing Network and we're working with HIPSO as well. So, and then we also have this DFI network that the DFI Alliance that we created in response to COVID as well. The holy grail is we can talk about collaboration all we want, but people have to actually operationalize that. We have to share deal flow. We have to make sure that we're not viewing one another as competitors. We are in the end, at least for the, the, the DFIs, we are public institutions. We are multilateral banks. You know, we have to 
treat ourselves that way and not emphasize our own bottom line over the public good. And so we have to share information. We have to think about whether collaborating is gonna benefit people as much as possible. Something we have to always remind ourselves. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. And this sets us up nicely for our next conversation where we will be continuing on this topic of COVID-19 and what it means in this space. So Adva, I'll hand it over to you.